Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Kristen LaFollette. I'm an assistant professor here at USI in the English department, and I teach for gender studies as well. And uh, I, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for coming to our second installment of our Queer Studies Lecture Series today. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing our speaker, but first I wanted to just remind everyone that we are offering our first Queer Studies course in the spring. So the spring 2022 schedule is live and the course is listed right now as GNDR 100X. Um, and it will be offered on Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11. And I'm really excited to teach this class and, uh, and we'd love to have you. So if you have any questions about the course or the gender studies program, feel free to contact me or Dr. Denise Lynn, who's the director of our gender studies program. So the talk today will be followed up with a question and answer session. So if you have questions, be sure to post them in the Q&A area here on Zoom. So, okay, all right, now to introduce our speaker for today, um, I'm very excited to have Dr. Mel Michelle Lewis joining us. They are the program director of the Ecosystems Sustainability and Justice Program and the faculty lead grants project director for the Natural Dye Initiative at Maryland Institute College of Art. And in addition to these roles, Dr. Mel is also associate professor of gender, sexuality, and black and ethnic studies in the humanistic studies department and co-founder of the Space for Creative Black Imagination and Interdisciplinary Research and Making Institute at MICA. Their personal, professional, and political commitments are to Black and Indigenous people of color and overlapping and interlapping queer, trans, non-binary, intersex, and feminist communities pursuing social and environmental justice. Originally from Bayou Labatry, Alabama, their creative work explores queer of color themes in rural coastal settings. Dr. Mel is a collaborator, DEI consultant with the Art of Change Agency, supporting critical voices and creative visions for sustainable practice, structural change, and social transformation within organizations, institutions, and communities. They also serve on the Baltimore City LGBTQ Commission and as the Women's Studies Quarterly Journal Arts Editor. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Mel Michelle Lewis. Thank you so much, Kristen. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you. Uh, this is an exciting series, so uh, it's wonderful to um, be invited to share a little bit about my work um, and have a conversation with you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Oh, if I can be allowed to do so. While we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and give our land acknowledgement. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. I recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and community. I acknowledge that my home and place of work are situated in the Maryland region now called Baltimore on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway, the Lenape, and the Susquehanna indigenous peoples. I honor all traditional custodians of this region. I pay respect to the enslaved Afro-descendants who tilled and labored on this land, who were brought, sold, and self-emancipated on this land. I recognize the continuing struggle for liberation in Baltimore's Black communities. I acknowledge settler colonialism and enslavement, as well as resistance and resilience. I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you. So I'm gonna read uh, one of my creative works from Bayou Mythology. Um, it's called Biomythography Bayou. And this particular biomythology um, is a piece um, that appears in one of my forthcoming manuscripts. I'm excited to share some of this work with you. And it's called Catfish Mardi Gras Queen. So we'll work on this piece first, and then we'll come back and see about screen sharing. So this is Catfish Mardi Gras Queen. You just like your daddy. This said and meant all kind of ways. Section one, relations. They call me Junior, even though I got a brother. He go by Dubois. He call me Junior too. 
Dubois is a blue heron, his regal and ready for Mardi Gras. He slick his hair and shine his shoes. He's slow and pretty. He go out clean and come back clean. He's still and sharp. He like to see and be seen. He like to look, but don't touch. Dubois don't like no trouble. Eyes a steady oak tree. Eyes brown and green and taut. Eyes fixed and fine. I come and go with ghosts. Eyes magic familiar. Eyes Spanish moss in the breeze. I ain't no lady. Ladies talk. They just say I'm trouble. They just say, girl, you better come give me some sugar. They just say, mm, you just like your daddy. Part two, lady friends. Tain't nothing wrong with lady friends. Folks around here know Miss Isidore and Ma Chevry all their life. Red got a lady friend in town now too. Tain't nobody this way seen who it is yet. Except Dubois and he ain't said nothing. He let Red drive his Cadillac. He let Red wear his sports coats. She careful and fill up the tank. She shine the rims and the windows. She dry clean his jackets. They both good at being friends and keeping confidence. Dubos don't like no trouble. Taint nothing wrong with lady friends. Ma Chevry can fix on your boat for a Sunday dinner plate. Clean your catch for a jar of fresh lemonade. Repair a cast net for a pecan pie. She just like her daddy, Captain Chevry. Everybody know about that. Ma Chevry's lady friends is Miss Isidore. She sew gowns and drink wine. Sing French and drink wine. Garden flowers and drink wine. Pray rosary and drink wine. Do hair and drink wine, root work and drink wine, make love and drink wine, but she don't cook nothing for nobody. Everybody know about that. Miss Isidore looking real good for her age. She sure like to flirt. When my chevry out fishing, she say, I's a handsome woman. I's just like my daddy. Miss Isidore like women and like mules seasoned and dependable. I ain't neither yet. Everybody know about that. Miss Isidore love Ma Chevry. Miss Isidore love her mules too, especially the one her daddy gave her. Black Magic Isidore been dead at least 40 years. The mule an old good boy. His name been Marion Anderson since the first day. He don't mind one bit. Miss Isidore love Ma Chevry and Marian Anderson. She call them both Ma with the same tenderness. She love them more than she could say to them or about them. Everybody know about that. Part three, Mardi Gras Kitchen. Miss Isidore, Dauphine and the ladies carrying on in the kitchen, sewing gowns and pressing hair, kings and queens and courts and parades balls all weekend, mass on Sunday, Mardi Gras gumbo, king cake on Tuesday. I ain't about to go nowhere dressed up like the Pope. I was just like my daddy. He don't go nowhere for nothing, except to visit lady friends, except a repast after the funeral of somebody humble, except the blessing of the shrimp fleet. I ain't thinking about nobody's Mardi Gras, except maybe thinking up under Dolphine's gown she gonna wear, but moss and salt water and hurricanes under her slip. Don't nobody ask me what I know about that. Ladies primping and fussing, can't find the parasol in the closet. Miss Tillman say it better not be in the tool shed with the fishing tackle and umbrellas. Mama dear get worked up. She say, parasol ain't no umbrella. She like to see my daddy walking round in the rain with all that lace trim she put on it. They all fall out laughing. 
Miss Isidore even spill half her wine down her bosom. Mama dear can hear in her left ear a little if she can get a joke in on my daddy, even though she don't hear nothing she don't want to hear. I ain't going in the kitchen. They gonna poke fun and try to get me up in a gown just to see if I'm as pretty as I am handsome. They know it ain't right. Dolphine can just tell them, yes, cause she know about that. Part four, Dolphine. I whisper to Dolphine through the screen back door, latched with a hook from the inside. Psst, pass me some moon pies off the counter. She suck her teeth at me. She roll her eyes. She latched herself with a hook from the inside. I ask, please. I say, I'm sorry. I mean it. She blush. She wink. She grin. She put her hands on her hips. She unlatch the door. She unlatch her smile. She tell me, go check on them crab traps she put down in the bayou with chicken necks this morning. She gave me some half melted moon pies out her pocket. She latched the screen door back. She latched her lips back. She turned her back, but don't walk away. We still feeling through the screen. Part five, Miss Katrina. Hey, yo, I got us the moon pies, Miss Katrina. I yell out to the bayou. Now don't nobody think catfish can hear you talking. That's just cause they ain't tried talking to them. Catfish got ears about like ours, you know, and plenty sense too. Hey yo, Miss Katrina come out the mud slow. She swim to me and lift the fin on her back. She float on her side and look at me with her two little blue eye. The same small two little blue eye Miss Tillman's tubby brown baby got. Everybody know about that. Miss Katrina keep me company while I pull the traps and see what crabs we got to put in the Mardi Gras gumbo. They still dancing and fiddling and pinching each other over what left of the chicken mix. Miss Katrina eat everything except what's on a hook and Miss Valerie's potato salad, just like anybody that got sense. Once I gave her some on a spoon just to see, Miss Katrina spat went back in the mud over that. She ain't come out till I give her a quarter pound of bait shrimp to apologize. I named her after the storm when the bayou changed. That's when she came to stay in the bend in our yard. She is big and the color of Mama Dear's thigh with a house coat hiked up high in the afternoon heat. I sink down in the bayou, open the moon pie wrappers. Let me see, Miss Katrina. You like marshmallow, chocolate, vanilla? Miss Katrina, catfish Mardi Gras queen. She like chocolate moon pie too. Miss Katrina make kisses at me. She got long whiskers like granddaddy Bo, like the photo in the foyer. And bout as friendly, no teeth in they smile. Miss Katrina got on red lipstick like what my daddy got on him when he come home after kissing and he don't know about it. I was just like my daddy. This said and meant all kind of ways. Thank you. It's exciting to uh, share a creative piece to start. Uh, and now I'll talk a little bit uh, about queer studies, liberatory education and creative praxis. Great. There we are. And present. There we go. So I'll begin here. So in this talk, uh, queer memory is one of the things that I find really um, inspiring for my creative praxis. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll tell you a story about my background and coming into my voice um, as a queer writer. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about liberatory education and some of the works that really have inspired me, both scholarly and creative. Uh, and then um, I'll do just one more reading and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So I'm from Biolabactria, Alabama. And if you've seen Forrest Gump, you may know Bubba Gump, popcorn shrimp, barbecue shrimp. Uh, it's a real town in Alabama. Uh, the movie was not filmed there, but um, this is the, the space and place from which I come and that has inspired me in my work. I am a Bayou princess <laughs> in many ways. And um, I was raised with a, a Black Catholic Creole family uh, in various traditions that um, are um, really an inspiration as I work on my own creative, um, my own creative pieces. Uh, Mardi Gras features uh, often, foodways and culture feature often, and even uh, themes of uh, Catholicism and religion feature in my work. So I'll tell you how I became a queer studies scholar. On a Saturday in Alabama in 1995, uh, I was maybe uh, in, I guess I would have been in high school, maybe sophomore year. Uh, I went to ballet class and then I really had sort of an epiphany. I understood myself and some of my ballet teachers and choreographers uh, as gay. And that was the terminology and the identity at the time. Um, and I had like a light bulb moment. Aha, this is something I would like to explore further um, in a scholarly sense. The first thing I wanted to do was go to the library. So I came home from ballet. I went to my parents' room and uh, I told them, you know, I'm gonna uh, probably go fishing or check a crab trap. I'm gonna run to the library because I'm gay and I need to look it up and I'll be back by dinner. And off I went. So as I uh, went to the library and wanted to explore this further, as I said, it was Alabama in 1995. So I went to the card catalog, and this was my first moment as uh, a queer studies researcher. We didn't have Google, uh, we didn't have Google Scholar, <laughs> we weren't able um, to even have a digital um, catalog. So I really went to the card catalog, it looks something like this if you've never seen one. <laughs> um, and I was looking up the word gay, G-A-Y, card catalog. It said, gay, see, homosexuality. Okay, pull the nut another drawer. And the two books that I found in 1995 in Alabama in the card catalog were an older book that was The Gay Yellow Pages, which I'm not sure what date um, it was the one that I found was, but here's an image of one from the 1970s. It wasn't contemporary, so it probably was a, uh, around this time. And then I found a new book and it was called Virtually Normal, An Argument About Homosexuality by Andrew Sullivan. And it was brand new. And these were the first um, texts that I ever encountered. Uh, one that, showed me very explicitly that there were communities and cultures and all kinds of events and um, uh, opportunities to connect uh, with folks in a gay and lesbian community, which was the um, identifier uh, on the material and the language and the identifier of the time that I was researching. And then in Virtually Normal, this argument about homosexuality, um, as the term was being used in this text was really an exploration of civil rights, uh, arguing that um, the military don't ask, don't tell, and also um, uh, uh, calling for marriage equality, that these were things that should be pursued uh, as civil rights ma uh, matters. So I decided to go to college and study these things. So I ended up going to Goucher College in 1998 
and I began studying women's studies and sociology to better get a handle on this information and also really understand my own experience. Uh, and in doing so, I really uh, was immersed in what was being called and starting to be called queer culture uh, at that time. And I was really excited to shave my head and get some really great combat boots. And this was the aesthetic of the time and it was fabulous. <laughs> While I was at Goucher, I had the honor of studying with Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. And Dr. Brown Douglas is now the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary. And at the time she was the um, director, uh, program director of the religion department and also taught in the Africana studies minor, uh, both of which I was exploring in my um, college curriculum. And the text uh, that Dr. Brown Douglas was writing and publishing and the topics that we were exploring in the class were really about sexuality in the black church and the black body um, from a womanist perspective. So I was immersed in these conversations about sexuality, black feminism, womanist thought, um, and even theological studies. I was really very and continue to be very inspired by my mentor. So some of my undergraduate readings were Zami, so a new spelling of my name. And this is a biomythography by Audre Lorde. And as you see in my own text, I still use this as a framework for writing uh, my own narratives, the biomythography format from this text that I began studying in undergraduate uh, still is um, very inspirational to me, as is Audre Lorde. Second, I was really interested in reading a lot of short stories, uh, as well as scholarly um, kind of research materials, um, looking at Black lesbians and Black lesbian life. So uh, the Afrikeet anthology, as well as the Does Your Mama Know anthology, were um, two of the uh, most interesting and, um, you know, texts that I could get my hands on full of stories of all kinds of people from different perspectives, um, sharing all kinds of different, um, uh, both analysis and, and also personal narratives. Um, so these were some of my really inspiring undergraduate um, queer studies um, frameworks. And these are all uh, what we might say as the canon is starting to take shape for queer studies, specifically Black queer studies, all of these texts um, are a part of that canon. Then I went on to study at Towson University and some of my graduate master's readings uh, have also been really inspirational. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of discussion uh, about public policy and civil rights uh, around um, marriage equality, as I said before, as well as um, uh, discussions about the military um, and don't ask, don't tell. Um, I also was learning more about other women of color, uh, radical writings. So this bridge called my back um, was a central um, uh, text for me as well. Uh, and I still write about that um, particular uh, anthology now. And finally, virtual equality. And this was um, actually a text that was a contemporary um, to the Andrew Sullivan text that I found in the library uh, in the 90s, um, but I wasn't familiar with it at the time. So I began reading some of these public policy elements and I decided to do a concentration in public policy to get a better sense of how does that fit within queer studies alongside all of the personal narratives and uh, the more creative work. And then in 2005, I started my PhD program at the University of Maryland. And that year, the critical anthology Black Queer Studies was published uh, by E. Patrick Johnson and May Henderson. And that anthology held many texts that were uh, both interrogating the intersections uh, of race, gender, and sexuality, um, and that were doing both critical studies in terms of culture and political um, inquiries. 
So I was able to actually take a class with this text at the center. And I was so overwhelmed knowing that Black queer studies was a thing, that this was actually a field um, that I could study in. And uh, I, at that time, decided, yes, this is absolutely not only uh, what I want to study, but also what I want to teach. I want to become a professor in Black queer studies and be able to share this material with others. During my graduate um, studies, I was reading things like Disidentifications by Jose, Jose Munoz and also uh, Aberrations in Black, Rod Ferguson. And these materials were really helping me to understand the new discussions and discourses in queer studies, uh, specifically with the lens of race and Blackness, um, both from a cultural perspective and thinking about the politics of Black bodies. Um, and I also was really exploring pedagogy and teaching and freedom in terms of how education about these materials uh, might be shaped. So I was also really inspired by teaching to transgress and lots of work by bell hooks, uh, thinking about teaching and pedagogy, since this was my um, my desire to uh, become faculty and be able to teach these materials and research and publish on them. And here are some of my glorious colleagues um, from my program at Maryland, and we all are um, uh, continuing to explore um, in our subject areas from our studies at Maryland. So as I was studying and gaining all of these credentials and becoming faculty and going all the way through tenure and publishing articles and chapters, I really still had this yearning for the creative work. Um, and I wanted to um, really piece together creative work that spoke to my, um, my background, my community, um, but also was uh, a part of the Black Queer Studies conversation. So here I just have my um, uh, artist statement, and I'll share one more selection uh, from Bayou Mythography Bayou. And as you reflect on the previous piece, the first one I read, think a little bit about how um, gender was explored and represented, um, how the story of family and community was put forward, and how some of the materials that I've just shared with you and their uh, impact on me and my work um, may have shown up. And so I'll ask you to do the same thing uh, for this last piece. So I'll stop sharing. All right. And this last piece is called Bayou Honeyman. Honeyman live freer than everybody else. Honeyman appear and disappear somewhere between Satsuma and Criola between Mon Lewis Island and Bayou Codin. Don't nobody know which creek Honeyman live on and ain't nobody going looking. Everybody think on what Honeyman do when they can't see what it is. Honeyman like a riverboat coming in and leaving out at the same time. Honeyman bring jars down the river woven in a basket in the crook of Honeyman's arm. Honey man a bee, round and sharp and spindly at the same time. Everybody like honey man sweet. Everybody wonder why they drawn the honey man when they can't think what it is. Honey man walk slow and hum low. Everybody feel honey man sound climbing round in their ribs. Bet like honey man. She run up a cloud of red clay. She liked to be first to see Honeyman come round the river bend. Bet clap her hands and point her toes. She meet Honeyman on Chickasaw Creek and sit in the boat for a ways. Bet sing and talk at Honeyman. She sigh, she show her neck. Bet fold and unfold, rocking the boat side to side. 
She bring a few pieces of pie to taste. Honey man like a slice of pie. George Waters like honey man. He take a jar out the basket and blush. George Waters stare deep at honey man, get low humming back. George Waters sweat and fidget, get brave, invite honey man skinny dipping in the cold swimming hole. George Waters unscrew the honey top, stick his finger in the jar to taste. George Waters like a basted ham when honey man bring jaws down the river. Honey man like a basted ham. Honey man love Letitia. She prop open her back door with a jug of whiskey when it rains. She play music and wait on the steps in her slip. Letitia braid and unbraid her hair. Letitia smoke tobacco in a pipe. Letitia walk around in high heel shoes and panties in the house. Letitia leave the windows open, except when Honey Man come. Everybody already know Letitia love Honey Man and a jug of whiskey. I love Honey Man. I skip in a circle. I squeal. I bounce. My dear call me, honey baby, you raising the dead with that racket. She threatened the cake in the oven we made for Honey Man about to fall. My daddy Bo called me, honey baby, come sit still. He hand me a cool glass of water. He rocked me in the rocking chair with his foot. My daddy Bo love Honey Man, been looking out from the porch all day. My daddy Bo got to wait till just one jar left. My daddy Bo love a jar of honey. Honey man come round the road, hum slow. I can feel honey man's hum between my shoulders. Honey man like a riverboat coming in and leaving out the same time. My daddy Bo run to the road and take honey man's basket, take honey man's hand. I race, I jump, I cling. I hold honey man round the neck. I sit on Honey Man's hip. I look in Honey Man's mirror. I'm a bee, round and sharp and spindly at the same time. Monday I call to me from the kitchen. Honey baby, fix your mama Honey Man a plate. Honey Man call me, honey baby. I save the last jar of honey for you every time. Thank you. All right. Let's go into our q and I'd love to invite discussion, questions, uh, or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Much appreciated. Uh, I'll, let's give everyone a chance to uh, start asking some questions. You can post those in the Q&A option we have available here on Zoom, and I will be checking those. Um, I, I think while people are, are posting, um, some of their questions, it, it might, maybe it's okay if I start by asking a question that I have. I was wondering just what is it like being a queer studies scholar at Maryland Institute College of Art? And like, what is that institution like? And what kind of programs do they have? And how do you see yourself as like a creative critical scholar um, at MICA? Oh, great question. Um, well, I feel in part because it's an um, art and design institution, um, MICA is very open and supportive um, of queer work and queer scholarship. Um, there is certainly a focus on art and design in terms of studio majors and programs, and that's what uh, all of the students and uh, have come to the institution to study. But many also um, are very interested in gender and sexuality studies and queer theory. Um, and I've been able to teach those courses and offer, uh, there is a, a minor um, within the humanistic studies program where students have their studio major and then they're able to minor with a, uh, an emphasis in um, gender and sexuality. So uh, that's been really exciting for many students. Um, I think folks are able to see 
both in, in terms of identity and their own personal experience, as well as artistic practice and scholarship practice, uh, that there are multiple connections. Um, some students and faculty are very much um, activists and they bring um, that foundation of um, knowledge around queer studies into their activist art. Um, other folks are very romantic in their exploration of their studio um, uh, mediums and might bring queer work into those um, uh, those pieces. Um, a lot of folks are playing with gender in terms of uh, animation, for instance. Uh, other folks are really thinking about queerness in the body, uh, perhaps as um, sculpture um, artists. So there's a lot of overlap and integration um, as well as support. Um, and I've been at many different institutions, so that's not always the case in terms of that, um, that openness. Uh, but at MICA, I think because in, in part because there is um, such a, a vibrant community of openness and a community of care um, that folks um, really are exploring these things, even if it's not their own identity or experience, um, they're able to uh, really open up not only to the knowledge, but then apply it to their artistic practices. Yeah, thank you. Great question. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one question that was posted. Someone said, thank you very much for being here. My question is, how would you personally define queer studies? You know, I love this question and I'm in, in part even defining what is queer, what is the term, what is the definition, um, in part queer queerness and queer studies, um, just as it, um, offers kind of a lens into exploring um, gender and sexuality among many different other intersections. It also is really built on the foundation of defying um, definition and defying kind of codification. Um, so in some senses, I do think, um, you know, queer studies and that queer exploration is really um, being, being able to analyze um, gender and sexuality among many other intersections um, from a perspective that allows us to, you know, think outside of the norms in which uh, we often are um, educated, uh, whether that's around, uh, you know, binaries and identity, uh, whether that's around um, how power should be situated in communities and by with the nation within a nation state. Um, those are all kinds of queer questions. So for me, queerness and queer studies is really boundless in many ways and defies uh, definition, just as it does seek to um, really uh, unpack um, and perhaps even transform society. Yeah, thank you. Great question. I appreciate that one. Thank you. This uh, next question is one that I would also love to hear your <laughs> response for because it's something that I struggle with myself as somebody who does creative and critical work, but how do you balance your creative writing time and your academic writing time? Oh, it's such, it's so unbalanced. Um, <laughs> it really depends on the deadline for me. Um, so sometimes I really want to follow my impetus when I'm feeling creative and take advantage of that moment um yet an uh, article is due that is very scholarly and has a, a particular research agenda attached to it or sometimes i'm really deep in the research and it's a moment where that creativity um output is su supposed to happen and <laughs> sometimes you just don't feel it um or are you have your attention elsewhere um, so I would say I haven't quite worked out the balance part of that, and I'm glad to hear that question uh, and hear that affirmation from both of you, because I think most people who do both scholarly writing and creative work um, struggle in this way. Um, but one thing that I have found is really bringing my creative work into um, my scholarship and my um, uh, research materials. So in some cases, um, you know, the reviewers have questions <laughs> about your format and why is why does it sound like this? Um, and it's much harder to do when you haven't had tenure and you, you know, if you're more junior, then it 
um, often there is an expectation that you follow a particular formula. Um, and, you know, I, I wish that I wish liberation for all from that from all of us, but also understand that sometimes to um, have those publications move forward, they do have to follow uh, a particular structure. Um, but whether you um, explore other, um, you know, locations for publications, other placements, um, or you decide to have, you know, uh, creative publications alongside, alongside your scholarship, um, I do encourage uh, bringing that, um, you know, creative voice into even the most serious research paper uh, that you have to publish. Um, and, you know, certainly I speak from privilege knowing that um, I, I don't have to publish in that way if I don't want to. Um, and yet there still are questions from uh, reviewers or journal um, editors to say this is this is an interesting piece, but I don't know if it's a fit because this is very clearly a research special issue. Um, but also being able to articulate why you chose that voice and why um, it has that creative aspect to it um, is another way to encourage editors to shift and change. And you know, uh, then the next person behind you that comes to publish. Um, or is grappling with this question of um, dueling, um, dueling writing styles uh, might have a, an easier time because uh, your your format is there as an example or an editor has experienced it. So um, yeah, again, I do try to really um, engage if I'm having that creative spirit moment, uh, but um, it is very difficult depending on uh, what you're supposed to be doing when um, and I, I don't always get that, um, you know, that output in the way that I'd like. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I resonated with so much of that. <laughs> um, okay, we have a couple other questions here. So, all right, this, oh, this is great. So this question, I just want to say that your pieces were beautiful, Dr. Lewis. I'm in the process of learning more about gender studies in general, because I think it's a research area I'm very interested in. And though my focus is mainly in women's studies, I'm very curious about queer studies and want to learn more about it. Since you're a scholar whose concentration is mainly in this area, what do you think sets black queer theory apart within the field of queer studies? Great question. Oh, thank you. And I'm excited for you to continue to explore these fields. Um, and I, I will say I understand them as interlocking, overlapping um, fields of study. Also thinking about the lineage of many of the, the scholars and creative uh, folks who have contributed. Um, you know, I, I in many ways feel like there aren't so many boundaries as we tend to use when we're saying this department is this, <laughs> that department is that, or this scholarship uh, is called queer studies. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I think um, your explorations can always be queer. So if, if it's women's studies and there's a particular feminist analysis, there is a queer aspect to that. And if there is a queer studies inquiry um, that is looking at gender and sexuality, those conversations also are in women's studies in ways that are overlapping. And that's not to say that uh, multiple fields don't uh, conflict. In some instances, they do. And there are border wars around, um, you know, uh, a political, in political aspects, inclusion, um, terminology, um, philosophy, uh, but that's that's what academia is. And so um, I, I do tend to think more in terms of a solidarity model. Um, but in terms of uh, Black queer studies, I was so excited in 2005 to see this um, anthology. And it actually was born of a conference that wanted to very um, clearly focus on um, Black queer studies and the emergence of, um, you know, or recognition of, I say emergence, but recognition of um, multiple historical um, scholars, philosophers, artists, activists, who have always been doing Black queer studies, who may have been known in their literary uh, lives, but weren't necessarily known 
uh, as a, what we would now call a queer scholar, or who may have been known as philosophers, but were not understood as queer theorists, be, both because of race and because of gender and or sexuality um, and queerness. And so um, there are ways in which Black queer theory is both kind of collapsing all of those borders in order to have that recognition for those who have come before us who have been writing about this um, and you know ha maybe writing maybe storytelling maybe um, making um, dance for instance if we think of Alvin Ailey um, who all can come into that canon I think part of the project of black queer studies is to collapse down um, this idea that queerness is the very high theory scholarship based um, endeavor. And in many cases, the canon and or the, the initial conversations about forming queer studies was kind of um, uh, folk, really focusing in on that intellectual element um, and erasing some of those other pieces. So I think in part, Black queer studies emerging um, from that that kind of conversation and coining of a field really did serve to bring in these other voices, specifically those with um, a Black perspective. Um, so that's one element. Um, and I do think it is recalling uh, and calling the question on uh, conversations in Black feminism and womanism that have that were already existing that certainly were what we would now call Black queer, queer studies or queer theory, uh, but that weren't recognized as such and maybe were, um, you know, adjacent to uh, Africana studies and Black studies and also were adjacent to uh, women's studies and feminist theory um, as those borders were drawn. Um, and now Black queer studies um, as almost one of the initiators of um, how we now use the term intersectionality is one of those engines that brings all of those conversations together, um, collapsing some of those borders and boundaries, uh, while also really being able to hone in on those specific intersections when we're thinking about race, gender, and sexuality. Yeah, great question, thank you. All right, so it looks like we have one more. Besides the resources that you have already mentioned, what recommendations you have do you have, both creative and critical, for someone wanting to further explore queerness or queer studies? Super. Oh, yes. Um, so I have lots and lots of ideas about resources. So that's one of my favorite things is to think about what is the you know where is my inspiration and then also where are the supportive works that um help me to think through um you know my own perspective and what it is that i'm trying to articulate and um you know posit in my argument or in my creative work um so i do i really feel that sometimes i'm reading something that is uh, really scholarly and that is you know well cited and has all of this analytical information and I'm finding oh there's actually a character there uh, for a creative work or there's a scenario there for a creative work and other times I'm you know really exploring um, creative writing um, and uh, whether that's you know fiction um, or poetry and I find, ah, that's a really interesting question that I would like to, you know, uh, research further and perhaps have a, a particular thesis about. So um, sometimes that makes reading for pleasure really difficult. <laughs> but, but I do um, actually love to pair those things. Um, and I think a lot of other folks are doing that. Um, and I'll, that's actually a, a great um, question for my final slide here i'm going to just share screen one more time um and i will go full screen you can see that there so i put a more to read um uh slide and bettina judd who's one of my beloved colleagues um and classmates from university of maryland um patient is both uh, about Black women's health and healthcare, um, as well as, uh, you know, a poetic exploration of uh, gender and sexuality. Um, Undrowned, uh, Alexis Pauline Gums is really exploring 
you know, black feminism and marine mammals. And this is just, you know, um, a, a science and ecology exploration um, that finds itself as a black feminist narrative and black feminist, um, you know, theory partner. Uh, so these are kinds of works that are really exciting to me. Um, and Yabo is a novella by Alexis Duvo, and it's really both um, historical fiction, uh, thinking about um, uh, Black communities in, in, that are now underneath Central Park, um, and those that have kind of been um, uh, explored. And, and there's an archaeologist in Yabo as a character, and that allows this kind of historical conversation to emerge. Um, while also really exploring uh, sexuality, the body, and identity um, through intersex and queer characters uh, with this overlay of race and racialization. Um, so these are some examples um, that I have to offer in terms of work that um, allows us to engage both creatively and scholarly kind of researchy work at the same time. Uh, and that that's that for me is the intellectual and um, you know kind of literary experience that I'm looking for. It's something that has all of those things together. Um, and I'll also say I'm really into um, uh, food writing right now, uh, specifically by black chefs. So uh, Edna Lewis and some of her books that are certainly recipes, but also have a lot of historical information. Um, Son of a Southern Chef, um, Michael Twitty's um, The Cooking Gene. There are all of these works out there that actually are mostly about cooking, but uh, so that creative piece is there, but there's so much historical analysis and um you know elements of of research um embedded in each of those recipes and the stories that are told about them are told in ways that are about you know um personal narrative and memoir so um that's another recommendation if you're looking for texts that don't make you separate um all of those things and make you really hungry <laughs> yes i like all of those things <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Those are all the questions that we had posted. We really appreciate you coming and sharing this today and helping us to work on launching our queer studies program here at USI and trying to get interest in that. Um, this should be available as a recording that you can view if you know anybody that's interested that weren't, wasn't able to make it today and wants to view the talk, this should be available as a recording on our gender studies website. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and hope you all have a good rest of your afternoon. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Thanks, y'all. I really appreciate it. This was wonderful. Great questions. Uh, thank you for your engagement. And I look forward to more news about the emergence of your program. <laughs>